All right, it's just about 11 o'clock right now. Um, Rachel, are you on? Are we good to go ahead? Yep, you can begin introducing the panel. Okay, great. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, welcome to our first panel of the day. Um, we have invited Dr. John Eichert back to be on this panel, as well as three individuals with local foods projects including Vic Thorne of Origin Malt, a company that developed a unique barley variety and partners with brewers and farmers. Paul Dorrance of Pastured Providence to discuss his work with pasture-based livestock operations and Dave Martin, founder of Bluegrass Farms of Ohio, a company that partners with farmers to grow non-GMO and organic grains. And we've invited each of them to discuss their projects and changes they've had to make to their businesses to face various challenges. Um, so I guess we can go ahead and get started with Vic Thorne. And we first learned about Vic Thorne's work with Origin Malt last year from um, our farmer who farms right outside of our office here. And he was very intrigued by the work of Origin Malt um, and their, their work to develop this market for barley. So um Vic are you here I don't see yes okay great well we are so honored to have you with us today and um and learn more about your project and and how you're connecting with farmers in our area um so if you want to go ahead and get started that'd be great sure thank you Lauren uh happy to be here thanks for th taking the time to hear our stories uh this is all very important I think for the agricultural community in Ohio and beyond um I could give a little bit of a history lesson to, just to set the framework of, of why I'm here and why I started Origin Malt several years ago. Um, in 1900, there were over 4,000 breweries in North America. I wanted to put, can you all see, I wanted to put on my shirt. And one of, the, oh, I like it. <laughs> one of the values of making beer is its main ingredient, which is not hops, it's okay. barley, it's malted <laughs> barley. So um, one of the issues that we've faced is prohibition. Prohibition. I can't tell who else joined us. I don't know if you have initials, I mean, that's fine. It, looks, it seems like we're having some difficulty. Maybe if, if you're not on mute, then try muting your your screen. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, sorry for that interruption. I'm gonna have to remove this person. No problem. Uh, so the brewers have traditionally made beer with the European style that uses about 50 pounds of malted barley versus in addition to about a pound or so of hops. So barley is actually the main ingredient in beer and you need a lot of it. Uh, Bud Light and Miller Light and Coors Light use about 17 pounds of malted barley. But back to the original story, in 1900, there were over 4,000 breweries and, and thousands more distillers, and a single malt whiskey is, is made with malted barley. And after Prohibition, all of the, the beer production and, and liquor production, production changed and shifted and was eliminated. And in, in that time around pre-prohibition, four of the, the six largest malting plants, barley malting plants in the continent were in Ohio. So Ohio was the center of production of barley for malting and for feed. It was a major crop. There were hundreds of thousands of acres produced in the, in the 19th century every year. And that all vanished when prohibition hit. So we went from 4,000 breweries in 1900 to fewer than 50 in 1980. And now we have the resurgence of independent brewers. We have over 8,000 brewers in the US alone. So you, have, you see this very interesting shift in a market from, that was due really to policy. But during that time from prohibition to the, the resurgence of smaller independent craft brewers, all of the growth of barley moved from our region around Ohio and surrounding states to the upper western plains uh, from Minnesota to, to Idaho, Wyoming, the Dakotas, and into Canada, where 
it was replaced here by corn and soybeans and export crops and and things that that have a have a stronger stabilizing economic impact. So here we are faced with a dilemma where nearly half of the craft beer produced in this country is within a day's drive of where we're sitting right now and where I'm sitting in central Ohio. And there is no barley being grown and there are no malting plants within a day's drive. Uh, there's, there's, there's one in Delaware and there's one in Wisconsin and not Delaware, Ohio, the state of Delaware. The rest are all west of the Mississippi or, or north of the border. So that sets the stage for an opportunity to try to bring the supply chain back to where it was originally, which is why I've, we've created the name Origin Malt. Um, there are a few challenges. One is uh, we, we didn't know if we could grow barley here that could meet the standards that would be required to make malting quality for brewers and distillers and food makers. And we didn't know if we, could, if we did find the right variety, if it could grow here, it yields that would be substantial for farmers and can it make money for the farmers? And then at the end of the day, can we sell it to the brewers after we process it into, into malt? So those were challenges that we faced trying to enter a market with very large incumbents and, and uh, kind of change the game a little. So we've been lucky. We, we have research at Ohio State that's one of the leading breeding programs for winter malting barley. And we discovered that there are some really interesting characteristics of, of winter barley that are very attractive for uh, us and from an environmental and a, and a social and an economic impact. So we, we, we need more winter cover crop in Ohio. Uh, one of the values that, that winter barley brings is it retains soil better than any other winter crop, about a ton per acre uh, additional soil retention by, by having barley in the ground versus leaving uh, a farm fallow for the winter. It also, with that, holds back significant amounts of phosphorus and nitrogen from runoff. So it has a very strong economic environmental impact and economic impact because if we can reduce the algae blooms in our waterways and, and rivers, streams, lakes, and ponds, then that reduces the cost to fix that. It enhances our ability to make money in resort towns that are on the water. So there, there's, a, there's a lot of value there. So we, we've worked with Ohio State and other uh, global partners to find varieties and identify and create varieties of, of malting quality barley that have yields that exceed the average yields of winter wheat. Uh, these varieties harvest a week to 10 days before winter wheat. So uh, it's very attractive for, for double cropping with soybeans. You get that one week to 10 days uh, that you have additional to be able to put soybeans in the ground can result in as, as much as 20 bushels in the yield of the soy. So it's very substantial for the, for the farmers. So the, the next challenge, once we've identified varieties and, and we, we kind of figured out that we can grow this in all corners of the state and, and even in neighboring states, and we've proven that it, that it does produce the right kind of malt that brewers are attracted to, uh, our barley, our malt is, is being utilized by uh, major brewers in Ohio uh, from uh, Rheingeist and, and uh, North High Brewing and, and a lot of great, great customers. We had to figure out how to scale up. So we started with a, a cup of seed for the variety that we selected and last year harvested just under 10,000 acres with over 94 farms. Um, and we're, we're, our plan is to grow to 75,000 acres to fill our malting barley plant, our, our malting plant in central Ohio that we plan to build. So the, there's significant environmental impact. Probably the most significant is actually going local. So uh, the, uh, just the amount of travel that grain has to move today from Saskatchewan to Columbus, Ohio is, is remarkable. And that's not nearly as far as it has to, most of the Pilsner malt today is imported from Germany. So you're talking uh, planes, trains, boats, and automobiles to get, uh, to get barley here that we can grow and process 
and have the quality levels that exceed those that are coming across thousands of miles. So just reducing the, the CO2 emissions, the amount of time and, and all those costs associated with travel to get barley to the processing from the farm to the malt house to the to the brewer is, is incredible. So that's a huge piece of our value proposition. So I think when we think about the challenges we face, it's getting the adoption, making winter barley part of a rotation. Uh, with the great data that we were able to collect in just a few years, we were able to work with the USDA and a group in Montana called Watts Insurance to, to go to the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation and get the highest standard malting barley endorsement for an, as an insurance writer that actually produces, an, an, it's a winter cash crop that is protected now, 80% of the value of the contract that we have with the farmer is protected with this insurance. And that is, that's something that will unlock, I think, a lot of potential for a lot of, a lot of uh, growth in the industry. But we also have to work with implementing strategies with barley that doesn't meet malting grade. So we're working with livestock and, and animal uh, feed and barley is actually highly nutritious and a very valuable grain. In Denmark and the UK, barley is the main feedstock. So I'll end with that. That's, that's kind of uh, where we are. We've built local, we've built great partnerships with the researchers, with the seed producers and with our brewer customers and farm producers. We have over 50 farm families that are part of our ownership group. And, and so we're, we're looking forward to really building a long, sustainable, uh, impactful company that enables farmers to have a, an option for a winter cover crop that can actually make them money. I will end there. Nick, that's great. Um, this is, it's really a fascinating project and um, I do see you're getting a couple of questions in the chat, but I think we should just move through our presenters and then we'll circle back to the questions. Does that sound all right? Absolutely. All right, so next um, we have Paul Dorrance of Pastured Providence. And um, we first heard about, I know a, a few of us who have helped organize this panel have seen Paul present before. We're really thrilled to have him back. And I, I think um, for one, I think Agraria is interested in converting some of their row crop land into um, a pasture into a pasture. So we're really excited to hear more about Paul's work. Um, so what, Paul, we're thrilled to have you. Thanks for being here. Um, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, sorry to be released uh, for the muting. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, I, for one, am super excited about Victor's presentation uh, as a home brewer um, and looking for uh, high quality uh, ingredients. Uh, he and I are definitely going to stay in touch. Uh, let me uh, share my screen if I may. I, I like slides. They keep me on track. Uh, and so can everybody see uh, a presentation screen? Yeah. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, my name is Paul Dorms, and um, before I get too uh, far into to kind of what, what brought me here, I wanted to give a little bit of history. So please forgive me for those who have seen me speak before, and, and these are old slides that, uh, that I say the same thing every time. So uh, I, I do want to just make sure that I tell people that I'm not a farmer by trade. I didn't grow up in a production system. I was country in upstate New York, but that's about it. I grew up around a, a small homestead uh, and then went to college in uh, Daytona Beach and got a degree uh, in computer science of all things and spent the next 12 years flying um, airplanes for a living for the military. So I was an Air Force pilot active duty. That is a very, very young version of me uh, standing next to a brand new truck that I still drive today. Um, over those 12 years, I, I flew uh, three different aircraft primarily 
Um, and along those lines, uh, for most of my, my life, I was uh, what I would call normal, meaning that I could care less about food. I didn't consider it. I made fun of organic. I, um, it was just not, I was, it was a convenience uh, thing that I just expected to be at the grocery store uh, when I needed it. And it wasn't until my, uh, my firstborn son, uh, who uh, was impending, that I really began to explore uh, lots of different things, to be honest with you, but food was definitely one of those things. And it changed everything about my, my trajectory. So 12 years into a, what would have been a 20 year commitment, uh, and I've been able to retire actually this year uh, and, and have a pension for the rest of my life. Instead, in August of 2013, I uh, jumped ship and uh, bought 111 acres on for sale by owner.com in Chillicothe, Ohio. And I started Pastured Providence from scratch. And so um, the farmstead for the next seven years from 2013 to 2020 produced grass-fed beef, grass-fed lamb, pastured non-GMO pork, as well as uh, pastured poultry. Uh, I did turkeys for Thanksgiving and then also did a free range non-GMO egg. Uh, all of those products were mostly direct marketed uh, to consumers, whether that was at a farmer's market or folks coming to the farm. Uh, I did uh, halves and holes and quarters, sort of custom cut ideas, as well as created some different bundles. Uh, I did have one amazing wholesale market um, uh, that was a local restaurant here in Chillicothe and I was for, for a period of time, the exclusive ground beef provider. So it was really nice to go into a restaurant and eat a burger or shepherd's pie or something like that and know that that was my product. So I do have some experience in the wholesale market, but most of my wheelhouse was direct sale, retail type of uh, marketing. Um, my, when my divorce was finalized in uh, April of last year, uh, I really came to a, a difficult place, as you can imagine, as I came to realize that my um, the, the farm, as I had set it up, really needed two, uh, two folks to, to handle it, and I was unable to do that alone. So I made the heartbreaking decision to, to sell the livestock uh, and instead uh, transition to making hay in the short term as I began to, uh, to repurpose my, my, my life, my professional life, to help other folks uh, take concrete steps towards and, uh, and be successful in pasture-based animal agriculture. So uh, Pastured Providence Farmstead shortened to just Pastured Providence and I began to pursue the three E's of educating, encouraging and equipping folks uh, for success in, in this type of agriculture. And it's from that perspective that I'm uh, uh, gonna talk to you today. Uh, I wanted to take those three E's if I, since I've got the microphone and just kind of talk about uh, some ideas that, that, that make me think about, uh, normally I, I educate and uh, encourage farmers, but Today, I'd like to talk to you, uh, and really farmers are in this group as well as consumers or, or eaters, perhaps even more generally. And from an education perspective, I feel like we as Americans need to really understand um, that, that there are some, some issues that need to be addressed. Um, depending on what study you listen to and who wrote the study, um, agriculture is, is sort of attributed to um, around 10 and a half percent of the United States and over uh, about a third of worldwide gas, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there, people talk about a 60 year clock, if that's not a term that you've ever heard before, the, the idea is that we are measuring our eroding soil and they is eroding 10 times faster than we're replenishing in, which if you draw that out on a scale means that we have 60 years before we cannot farm, we cannot grow food because of the erosion of our existing uh, so that's a really big issue. In that uh, same vein of things, we have this idea, especially from a livestock perspective, where we have a market share of the big four, Tyson, Cargill, JBL, uh, Smithfield, grew from 21% in 2002 to 53%. So over half of the market share held by four companies. And those same four companies in 2014, 85% of the beef processing in the entire United States. The number of slaughter facilities, continues to shrink. So you see this idea of consolidation of the industry, right? Uh, plummeted 70% since 1967. And these aren't the big plants that are going out of business. See the small mom and pop local processing. Uh, and I, I'm calling attention to that specifically um, uh, as I'll get to here in a second. Uh, so it, in general, all of that has uh, contributed to farm debt jumping by 33%. We haven't seen levels of farm debt uh, like we are right now since the 1980s farm crisis. 
I say all of those things, not for doom and gloom purposes, but to call attention to the fact that in my opinion, we Americans don't consider food very well. We don't, we, we, and I, again, I told you I was guilty of this, right? I, I, I assumed that the food was going to be there when I went to the grocery store. But if you look at this chart from the USDA, you can see that the disposable income in 1960 that we spent on food. Um, so this is after you basically you make your money, you pay your taxes, and the rest is called disposable income. Uh, and so in 1960, we spent 70, 17%. 2019, we're almost half of that. Less than 10% of our disposable income is spent on food. And that's because of the system that we have in front of us right now that allows us to ignore the importance of food. And so my challenge to us, all of us, is that, and obviously I, I do wanna say that I don't wanna be guilty of cherry picking a, a statistic because we see that happen, right? Where folks would grab a hold of one little uh, thing and make it a, a big deal. But so there's so much more to the story. I will acknowledge that. But my takeaway from this is that we as Americans do not value food and we need to value food more than we do in order for any sort of uh, project or proposal to be ultimately successful, um, we need to background that from a consumer perspective, from a from an eating perspective, and value food more than we do now. That being said, I'm actually uh, very encouraged uh, by by lots of different ideas. Um, so national beef consumption actually fell 2.3 percent over the last uh, you know 10, 15 years or so, but grass fed specifically has doubled every year exponentially from 17 million in 2012 to over uh, almost 272 million in 2016. Grass-fed uh, commands up to a 70% premium over grain-fed. And so you have this idea that overall beef consumption is dropping, but grass-fed is hot right now. And it's hot not because it's a fad, but it's because consumers are seeking to support healthy, humane choices. We have this uh, grass-fed studies that are out there now that talk about the uh, three times more of the omega-3 fatty acids, which are much more beneficial, and therefore the ratio uh, between omega-3 and omega-6 is better. You have three times more uh, vitamin E than, than grain-fed beef, and on and on and on. And there's an animal welfare component that has to be part of that conversation as well, where we have educated consumers rejecting a confined animal feeding operation scenario uh, and again, rightfully so. So I'm encouraged by these kinds of things that we're beginning to see. Uh, and now switching more towards like a climate sort of concept, again, we're beginning to see, because in most conversations, especially if they're conventionally led, you have just animal agriculture lumped into one big group, right? And we, as I mentioned in a previous slide, uh, depending on the study, 10 and a half to 33% of greenhouse gas emissions. And so you have this idea, speaking of cherry picking statistics, where they say, hey, uh, grass-fed beef emits more methane than grain-fed, which is technically true. However, when you take one step back or one step up and look at it from an elevated systemic perspective, it changes the entire conversation. And so uh, White Oak Pastures, to, uh, my friend Will Harris down in Bluffton, Georgia, he got uh, his life uh, cycle analysis done on his farm and his carbon footprint is 111% lower than a conventional operation his integrated systems are six times more carbon efficient than conventional. And overall, his production method for beef specifically is net negative when it comes to carbon. Granted, that's just one measure, but nonetheless, it's exciting to know that he's producing healthy food humanely and he's netting carbon into the soil compared to conventional beef, which uh, creates 33 uh, Beyond Burger even, vegetable options for, for alternative plus four, and even just regular or conventional soybeans, still plus two. So none of those operations are sinking carbon into the soil. Grass-fed beef production is. That's really encouraging for me. Uh, and then my final three E is equipping, right? And so that um, want to talk about this project that I have going on. Myself and several others are working on um, a uh, a project called Planning to Advance Mobile Meat Slaughter and Processing. And it's specifically targeting one option uh, or, or something that exciting to address this idea that we have producers who are excited about producing grass-fed uh, meats and pasture-based livestock products. We have consumers who are clearly desiring uh, to, to buy that. And then we have a tiny little soda straw that we're trying to shove all those animals through with this uh, middleman infrastructure processing problem that we've had. And it's always been a problem, it's even worse, 
but it's just revealing uh, the, the real issue that we have here is, is the, uh, the small scale processing piece, that consolidation of those big four and all those mom and pop slaughterhouses going out of business. And so this is a local food promotion program planning grant, it's a word, uh, uh, mouthful. It runs from October 19 through March of 2022. And it's, uh, we're going to conduct a feasibility study on the uh, idea of bringing mobile meat processing slaughter to Ohio. And in addition to, again, presuming feasibility, uh, building a, a cooperative model, business plan and financial plan so that uh, the next step can be action uh, and bringing this exciting possibility to Ohio. Uh, so again, I'll just wrap up by saying uh, pursuing these threes uh, from educating consumers uh, and farmers uh, is my job, but also again, all of us uh, uh, educating on the value of food. I'm encouraging and encouraged by pasture-based livestock models as solutions to health and climate issues and equipping, uh, in this case, not the project that I'm here to discuss, um, uh, small scale producers with processing options, freeing up the, that marketplace so that they can satisfy the demand that's clearly there. And all of that is really, I mentioned it's my firstborn uh, now uh, or, or uh, relatively. And so, I mean, he's what got me started in this. And so I really am pursuing these three E's, if you will, for the benefit of the next generation. I don't want to pass on the system that we currently have to my son uh, and to, to your children. Um, again, uh, as we mentioned, we'll hold questions to the end. Uh, this is my website, pasturedprovidence.com. Feel free to take a look at that if you'd like, and I will happily uh, put that in the chat as well. And then this other form is a Google form that uh, that's my cue to copy and paste that into the chat as well. If you want uh, more information on the, or just to keep in touch with that LFPP planning project that we have going on, uh, that would be amazing. And I will drop that to uh, that form into the link as well. Uh, again, thank you so much for your time and looking forward to any questions you have. I'll stop sharing and give up the mic. All right, Paul, thanks so much. Um, I just spoke to a landowner the other day who's interested in doing a mobile processing um, facility, but it comes with a big price tag. So he was worried about that. So the cooperative model is, is really interesting. Um, I'll have to mention that to him. Uh, but our next thing, so Paul, thanks so much. And um, I'm really looking forward to the Q&A here. Um, and our, our next speaker is Dave Martin, founder of Bluegrass Farms of Ohio. And great, Dave, I see you now. Um, so we first learned about Dave because um, we have a few farmers who we work with who um, do have organic operations and, and, um, and they sell their seed to Dave. And so that's kind of how we learned about Bluegrass Farms of Ohio. Um, so Dave, you wanna go ahead and get started? Sure, I'll give it my best shot here. Forgive me, I'm a little bit new to the Zoom uh, process, so I'll try my best to connect. Uh, do you hear me? Yep, we can hear you just fine. We can okay. see you great too. Uh, yeah, so this is at the point you'll be able to share a screen. How's that? Perfect. Okay, great. So are we ready to go? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah, so my name is Dave Martin, and uh, I'm the founder of Bluegrass Farms of Ohio. Um, I uh, just wanted to say uh, good morning, and, and uh, I really appreciate you uh, allowing me to uh, share our company with uh, the viewers here. Um, we're a non-GMO uh, supplier of uh, non-GMO grains to uh, most Asian food companies, uh, and we uh, have a grower based of uh, about 100 uh, growers in and around uh, Southwest Ohio. Um, we specialize in identity preservation and uh, supplying soybeans uh, for those foods such as tofu, miso, uh, natto, uh, and uh, various other uh, Asian type of foods. We also supply uh, soy milk companies where we match uh, these special soybeans uh, that are bred specifically for these food uses. And we match the growers by supplying them the seed source. 
and then we take the grain that they produce and then we uh, clean it and we process it um, in um, Jeffersonville, Ohio. And then we package it and we sell it uh, overseas in seed containers. We also have a presence in the United States where uh, we have quite a few uh, processors of, of the various uh, Asian foods on the East Coast and on the West Coast. So we supply them as well with the identity preserved non-GMO soybeans. So I was asked today to uh, kind of give a, a company overview of what we did and then uh, explain how it's, how it's changed uh, over the last uh, uh, year with, with uh, the pandemic and how it's affected us. So I'm gonna try to relate uh, at the same time as we go through my presentation in, uh, uh, to, to, to how, how it has changed here over the last year. But to give a summary, uh, not only do we identify identity preserve, we, we have all the verifications of uh, different processes uh, that we do that are uh, certif certified um, by various uh, agencies, such as organic, non-GMO, um, and, and, and the likes. And I'll, I'll get to that here in a, in a few minutes. We also give laboratory analysis of everything for, for verification and process so, so that everything is the same size, shape, and color, and, and pure. Uh, we guarantee 99.5% uh, purity of each of the varieties that we, we produce. <clears throat> and then uh, we package it in various forms. Uh, a lot of times it goes out in 30 kilogram bags uh, or a tote bag, uh, that's a metric ton. And also uh, we'll do a bulk in a container. Um, we're, we're committed to identity uh, preserved um, and our, our customers demand that uh, our, our, our cleanliness is of the utmost of importance. Uh, they also want to make sure that the farmers that they're dealing with are of, of a standard that are very conscious about food safety and cleanliness and and uh, follow good um, uh, farming practices. They want to make sure that uh, uh, they uh, follow the labels of any uh, uh, spray chemicals that they might have or they use on their farm. And, and um, they also want to make sure that the food that they're eating or the soybeans that they're consuming is safe. That's, that's what's the most important. That's the confidence factor. So this is our facility uh, in Jeffersonville. Uh, it's, uh, we hold on site about uh, all, just shy of 3 million bushels. Uh, the containers that you see all lined up are the containers that we fill each day. Uh, we, we process uh, about 16 containers uh, full of soybeans, uh, go into various food companies. And, and um, each is a separate variety. Like I, like I said, and we want to make sure that uh, we're in compliance with all of the standards. One of the things that the pandemic has um, has done in, in our business is it's actually brought the attention how important food safety is. Everyone is aware of healthiness, right? Uh, that was before the pandemic. We were all worried about. Uh, the contents, uh, making sure that our our, our uh, food that we eat is a non-GMO and 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 B, it's 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 healthy. It's uh, for us the, and uh, as as far as the food itself. Now, in addition to that, food safety from from uh, every shape and form has become almost the spotlight of the attention now. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because what was important before the pandemic versus what's important to the consumer now is, is it has changed. It's just been brought to the, the spotlight. There we go. So we have about, uh, we range anywhere between 60 and 80,000 uh, acres to put it in perspective. We get about a metric ton uh, off of each acre. And, and um, for, for our food, uh, we, we actually have two facilities and one facility, uh, there's 
one is across this uh, road from the other. And uh, the one facility that is our packaging plant and, and our sorting plant is 100% non GMO. Okay, that's the label that uh, is identity preserved. That's actually brought to us by the Ohio Seed Improvement. Uh, the yellow tag means that it's they follow the matrix all the way through the system. And when I say follow the matrix, what, what they do is uh, they're with us uh, through every step of the way seed improvement is to make sure that the seed is pure that, that they plant, to make sure that the fields are pure. Um, they have a host of uh, field inspectors. Uh, there's uh, 30, so a lot of them are uh, retired um, uh, professors from Ohio State and a lot of grad students. And they walk our fields and um, they, they check every field that is produced for uh, six times throughout the field where they uh, have a six foot by six foot area and they count every soybean and make sure every soybean is, is the exact same. They wanna make sure all the leaves are the same, all the flowers are the same, all of the, uh, uh, the plant height, it's, it's a, there's about eight characteristics that they look for. And, and the idea of this is to make sure that every field is, is pure. The other thing that we do is, uh, we, we take samples out of every load and, and we do a grow out tests. So, so we're, we're actually uh, uh, testing the genetics. And one of the things is unusual uh, and unique to what we do is uh, providing this grow out test. Uh, we do a thousand seeds out of every, every lot and every lot is, is about 750 bushels and um, they grow it out. And uh, one of the things if they do is once it's grown out is they spray it all with glyphosate to make sure that uh, all of the little seedlings that they spray with glyphosate die. Um, this is one of six times uh, through our process that the purification is, is, is tested and, and um, we have a pretty high standard out of out of a thousand uh, seeds uh, when it's um, when we're testing the seed lots before it gets grown. We have a zero tolerance. It's uh, if there's one of these little plants that doesn't die and he, it continues on. That means he's a GMO, and and uh, we'll actually reject that seed lot. Um, our grains we have a 99.5 percent assurance. And uh, we'll actually let one of those critters, when it's grain, if, if one survives, that's okay. One out of a thousand, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and pass that. Okay, so here, this is, this is our, uh, one, our, our packaging line. Uh, as you see off to the left there, uh, we have lots of equipment that, uh, to, to clean and sort. All of the soybeans have to be the exact same size, shape, and color. Uh, the, 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 the bag of soybeans has to be perfect. It's for food. And, and so most, uh, there's two types of food grade soybeans uh, in, in our world. There's those that get coag that are coagulated. And then there's those that are actually fermented. And the coagulations, example of a coagulation soybean is uh, like a tofu bean or, or a, um, uh, and that's, that's the best example where it's, it's a, a you're making cheese and uh, tofu is cheese. It's just, uh, instead of milk, we use soybeans. Uh, the fermented process is, um, if you have go to an Asian restaurant, and eat, uh, miso soup, uh, that's an example of a fermented soybean. And, and uh, so, so um, we service both types. Uh, soy sauce is another fermented type. Okay, so, so this is kind of put in a simplistic way. It, uh, we have this, this uh, um, kind of goes through all the different pieces of machinery that we have that, that uh, uh, each one does a, a, a unique thing. And I, I always like to show this because uh, it, it, it takes, takes uh, a specialized piece of equipment to do every, every process. And, and uh, um, it, it, 
it, it just makes sure that, the, that when the beans arrive, they're, they're all nice and clean and the same color and, and nice and bright. Then off to the left, you see our, um, our little robot there. He, uh, his name is Coffee Break. And uh, he, uh, he does a really good job stacking to make sure all of the soybeans are stacked and nice and perfect when they arrive in the container. And by the way, he, he never takes a coffee break. Okay, this, this kind of shows our, our uh, the, 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 the packaging that we, uh, that we provide, where I say 30 kilogram bags off to the left, the one ton metric ton tote bags uh, up top, and then the 20 ton bags that go into the sea containers. All three of these go into the sea containers at, this, at the same time um, in, in, in various uh, ways there. Up top was interesting. That's uh, that was a huge warehouse that we uh, we leased when the um, uh, tsunami hit uh, Japan. Uh, that was an automobile uh, part warehouse, and and uh, all shipments were stopped. I took a picture and and kind of saved that. Uh, we normally don't. We're just in time packaging. We don't really warehouse our uh, pack packages. But in that particular case, uh, since Japan stopped buying soybeans for almost six months, uh, we kept going and, and uh, we leased that warehouse and uh, saved it for them. So our processing plan could keep, keep moving along. And then once uh, the ports opened back up, uh, we, were, we were able to uh, empty the warehouse. Okay, so so this is uh, the certifications I was uh, I, I I mentioned before uh, that has really come into light. I mean, for the last um, ten or so years, uh, the, the emphasis and the focus has been on the non-GMO project, which is the the bottom left symbol uh, that you all have grown and, and know uh, recognize. Uh, that started. Uh, it, it, at a round table uh, out in Anaheim, California. I was at a conference about, uh, it was about 12 years ago. And um, it's a small group of soy processors. I, I belong to the, um, the association and they had this idea that they wanted to distinguish our, our soybeans. And so that, um, it was an idea that was talked about uh, amongst uh, a handful of, of people and, and uh, it was pretty neat. I got to be at the, the ground floor of the idea and uh, watched it grown to about 14,000 different food, food groups and, and uh, la labeling 14,000 different types of, of, of um, food. And uh, each one is uh, verified and uh, in a very strict form. The, the, uh, the, next, the next slide off to the right, uh, that is, is uh, is kind of new to us. Uh, that is the uh, what's called global gap, and global gap is uh, we try to get our most of our farmers uh, certified in global gap, and and uh, what that does is it's there's an audit that um, we go to the farm and and uh, uh, kind of get to know the farmer and ask a lot of questions. Uh, some of the farmers think it's it's a little bit extreme, but it's really not. They're just trying to get an over, uh, just a feel for what kind of a, not only what kind of a farmer are they, but what kind of a person are they? Do they care about the, their, 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 what they grow? Do they uh, take pride in it? Do they uh, go the extra mile to, to uh, isolate and, and uh, be very conscious about food safety and, and uh, purity and cleanliness? and, and uh, it's really uh, interesting to, to go on those uh, surveys um, with, with, with the global pack folks. Every year we have, um, we have to go through that recertification for that. Whereas the non-GMO project, uh, that's more of a, a, it's more of a process verification. So the, um, we have, this is only a handful of the certifications. I think we have about uh, eight or nine different certifications that we have to be uh, aware of in our, in our business. Uh, kosher, for example, off to the, 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 the symbol on the bottom right is one of them. And, and uh, probably one of the strictest uh, certifications that we have to follow is the SQF. Um, there's 
that's a very strict standard and that is um, our own processing facility that uh, uh, once a year we're uh, subject to a, a spot check where they come in and uh, not only do they do um, a, a complete an uh, audit of our books, but they do a complete audit of our site. And they're, uh, we'll get cited if they find a bird feather. We'll get cited if they uh, see anything that's um, not, it's not supposed to be in a, in a food processing plant. It's, and so to achieve the SPF standard is, is very, uh, very, very uh, tough to get. I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Steve, if you could wrap up in about two more minutes or so, because I want to make sure we get through questions. And Okay, so that's it. <laughs> so you ask, I will deliver. <laughs> well, okay, thank you, Dave. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, that's that. This last year is something I've been learning about. It, all these different certifications people have to pull in, and it, there's a lot, you know, a lot that goes into being organic, or um, you know, at least being able to claim that. Um, uh, yes, that's right. Yeah, the organic is, is another certification that uh, we do process uh, or, organic grains. Uh, and, and, um, uh, and, and yeah, that's, that's also another process where you, you're, it's very strict, no chemicals. And uh, when it comes through our plant, our processing plant, we have to shut down absolutely everything, clean everything out, and then we have to verify each and every pound where it all goes. Uh, the byproduct and and all the way through and and it's it's audited very strictly too. Right. Well, I think um, we are getting a couple questions for you. I do want to um, um, go back to Dr. Dr. Eichard, um, who was just gave us um, the presentation before the panel, and um, I think John, you were going to kind of go over some of the challenges that local food groups face in general. Um, yep. Yeah, I'll keep mine very short because I know there's going to be uh, questions for the other speakers here. But, but the challenges that I see with with local groups coming together, uh, basically, is is I think that producers can be pr pretty competitive and pretty efficient in terms of producing, you know, organic, low low input or ecologically sound or whatever biological farming whatever they're doing there. But the, the bottleneck tends to be when you get into the processing and distribution end of it. And there are significant economies of scale in terms of operating at a significant size when you get into the processing and distribution, as you've seen here in the soybean processing plant and also in the malting and things of this nature, there's a significant size involved in that. So if you have one person that owns it, then they can contract with the individual producers and make it work as you've heard here. But if you're going into a co cooperative sort of operation where you're saying, okay, the producers will get together and they'll establish their own processing organization or their own distribution like a food hub is, then that's where you run into some major obstacles when you try to get into the processing distribution end. and it's people working together. We've kind of lost the ability to, to work together of how to form and keep relationships so that it all works together. For example, in a meat processing plant, you were talking, Paul, you were talking about a mobile meat processing plant, there's quite a bit of experience with that. You have to get the producers so you can keep that processing plant busy a significant period of the year and get the producers that are cooperating to schedule their production so that they're willing to kind of share the best times of the year in order of processing your product. So you have a constant flow going into the, going into the market. And, and so it's important there. Or if you have a vegetable operation, you're trying to provide to schools or you're trying to provide to the, the other larger markets, or you're trying to run a vegetable processing facility, you have to get these farmers all to work together. And it's very difficult. And one of the things that I've talked about in cooperatives or one structure you go to, but if, if people come together solely for an economic reason, then you're gonna find at some point in time, individuals will have a better oppor economic opportunity for a short period of time somewhere outside of this collaborative relationship. And I think if you're going to sustain a collaborative, cooperative organization, you have to have people that have shared core values of what they're trying to accomplish, a particular kind of 
beef operation or a particular kind of vegetable operation. It can't be just because you're trying to make more money. Uh, you need to look at the economic dimension of this collaborative cooperative relationship as, as a facilitating process. It allows you to do what you want to do. It allows you to be the kind of farmer or rancher that you want to be. It allows you to be the kind of person that you want to be in terms of your relationship with your customers and your family and your community. And the economic piece is just the facilitating. It's a means to that end. Uh, so that's that's kind of the obstacles I've seen is getting people to work together because we farmers in particular pride themselves in being independent, uh, you know, making their own decisions and things of that nature. And we need to recognize in this case, if you want to farm the way you want to farm and live the way you want to live, then we have to learn to get together with people and to form and maintain relationships, which is very difficult. Most of us, particularly old men, are very terrible at relationships. We have to learn that all over again. Uh, but anyway, that's all I want to say and leave time for questions to some of the others. Great. Thank you, John. I, um, I have been gathering some questions as we've gone along with the panel. Um, so I'll just kind of go through them and, and um, Rachel, Alex, Krista, just jump in too. Uh, but, but Vic, um, I want to go back to you. You got some very specific questions. When will the barley processing plant be built? Um, and, and will that happen in Columbus? And how does the protein content compare to spring varieties of your barley? Yeah, so our, our plan is to break ground this year and it'll be about two years before it's all completed. So our goal is to have our plant fully operational by the end of 2023 in Marysville, which is in Union County, uh, just Northwest of, of Columbus. Um, and the protein, the variety that we actually, the varieties of, of malting barley that we search for have modest protein levels, so 10 to 12% and they're intentionally at, that, at a lower level than what you might grow for feed or for other purposes or food. Um, and they're, they're about the same as, as the levels of protein that are grown in spring varieties uh, in Canada and in Europe. Okay, great, thank you. And um, um, Paul, I'll go to you, um, Alex, Alex asked how, how do you speak to people who don't care about these conversations? And I, I think she's referring to um, conversations such as how do people convert to, um, you know, start caring about the food they're eating and, and wanting to spend more money on that. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, so, right, because everybody has to make that individual decision to to care enough to spend um, more than they are now. I won't put a number to it, but just in general. Uh, and so I guess my, my, my answer is that, um, is that you meet them where they are. Um, I think too oftentimes those conversations come with, uh, with a fair amount of judgment and, uh, and a lot of holier than thou. Uh, and so I think it's very important to recognize that in general, uh, almost everyone is doing what they think is best, how they, you know, uh, the decisions they're making are not um, uh, risky uh, or wanton in the, in the sense that they are um, deliberately disregarding their, their health or their well-being or their family, right? So, so understanding that everyone's trying to do the best they can, they can in an environment that is deliberately muddy and foggy. Um, the, the, the misinformation around food is, is unbelievable to me. And the more and more I learn and the more the messaging that's out there, it's, it's you can't blame anybody for trying to, to chase, you know, different, different things that are coming out. Um, and, you know, add collusion on top of that between re re regulation and, and government organizations. And it's just, it's a, it's a hell of an environment to try and eat in. Uh, so um, that being said, if you're meeting folks where they are, and speaking to their need. And that's, that's what I like so much about uh, pasture-based livestock systems is because there's, there's kind of something for everyone. If you, you know, there's a human health aspect of things. So you could care less about the environment. You're looking internally to you and you're looking for, uh, for a better option to eat. Um, I, I have that, right? I have that for you. If you're 
uh, you know, trend more towards economic or excuse me, uh, ecological or uh, environmental issues. And you're really concerned about uh, clean water and, and runoff from industrial models or, uh, or climate change issues. So pasture-based livestock addresses that. So there's that component of things. Uh, there's a, uh, you may not care about any of that and all your concern is for that animal. Uh, and making sure that if we're going to raise meat, we're going to do it right and do it well, and that we're not going to confine them uh, into a, an operation that, that requires them to stand on a you know, mound of their own manure. Uh, so if, if that's your concern, then we, I have an answer to that too. So I like that, that pasture-based livestock systems in general tend to have lots of different angles, if you will, to really find uh, and speak to folks where they are um, with the understanding that they have the very best of intentions um, but nonetheless, and, and really the bottom line is just to do a little bit of research, ask them to do, to, to stop for a second and put roughly the same amount of effort that they would into buying their new cell phone, do that amount of work and research into their food. And I think that at that point, uh, that's really all it takes is, is just that level of concern. And if they, if they do that and they still decide to go, you know, eat, um, at a fast food restaurant that serves, you know, crappy beef. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, if they've done the research and made a conscious decision, that's all I can ask somebody to do. And it doesn't have to be a whole bunch. Like I said, we spend way more time considering our next cell phone purchase than we do considering what we're going to put in our body three times a day. So that's the bottom line ask is just take a little bit of time to really consider um, food again. I hope that answers the question and thanks for it. Thank you. Paul. So um, Dave, you um, got a question for how much of a premium do farmers get? Um, I kind of want to broaden that question maybe to all the panelists and how do you um, enroll farmers and, and how do you find farmers? So another question was how do you find producers with your shared values? lessons learned so far. So I guess more broadly, I'm kind of curious and how do you get um, how do you, you know, get um, Vic in your situation? How do you, um, how do you find these farmers? And uh, and um, yeah, and so, just what you've learned so far. Yeah, uh, I, it's it's really interesting because um, you know you find the farmer, the fine farmers find are finding us as much as we're finding them. It's people that are leaning into this that are want to go back, like John said. Uh, earlier, they want to go back to being family farms and have rotation crops that they can be proud of and and they can produce goods that that you know if you see them on your plate you're 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 happy that they're there or in your glass you know what the ingredients are so we align really well with with uh, you know folks that would be producers for for bluegrass that know how to manage a crop and and produce things at the highest level of quality and and not have all the chemical applications and, and things that uh, you know that that GMO producers use. So I, I think there's there's a very strong community of, of folks that have shared values and they kind of find each other. Uh, but our core group that we started with are ten seed seedsmen, and they know because they sell the seed to the soybean producers and corn. They know who are the farmers that manage their proper that manage their crops are not afraid of doing something that has more maintenance requirements and are and want to get into these sort of markets so uh, there's there's a really good network within Ohio that that starts with the seedsmen that know the farmers and the farmers that are looking for options like this to be more sustainable and Vic are the farmers you work with are they receiving a premium for their seed yes so feed barley has typically been two to four dollars a bushel. We pay six to seven dollars a bushel. So there's a good premium to over what feed barley would be. And malting barley, we're, we're a premium over what malting bar barley sells for in Canada and the in the upper western plains too. We're about 20 to 20 or 30 percent higher typically than what they're getting paid on, on the spot market. Let me let me just add to that. I think there's more than enough consumers out here, customers that really want something different. The uh, the retail surveys indicate something like a third of the people want something different from what they're getting in the supermarkets today, whether it's uh, 
organic hormone antibiotic free or or um, environmentally sound climate friendly a whole range of different things that they're looking for and i think there's there's more than enough farmers particularly some of the younger farmers that realize industrial agriculture is not sustainable in the long run and they're waiting for somebody to come up with an idea or them to find an idea of how they could go to be more like a traditional family farm in terms of the values. The key is, or the challenge is to bring those two together to find opportunities that appeal to the people that want to change the way they farm and to find opportunities that appeal to the customers that want something different than what they're getting. And I think it's just a matter of bringing those together. Now, once we've transformed about 50 to 70% of the food system, then we may have to start looking for <laughs> selling other people. But I think the, the market is far bigger. The opportunities are far bigger than we're able to take advantage of right now. One, one of the things that we have found, uh, and, and I agree with, with both the panelists here, um, is, is that um, you, you do have some growers that, that are, uh, seeking uh, uh, premiums, seeking ways in which they uh, uh, would like to grow non-GMO and organic. But what's interesting is it, it has to make economic sense for them. And, and uh, if it doesn't, uh, very few are gonna uh, act on just principle alone. So, so that's why we have those premiums. Um, and it's not necessarily for any kind of a yield drag, it's the extra step that they have to take uh, that's required to get that status of, of food grade and, and uh, uh, the effort of, of keeping things isolated. And, and uh, what's interesting is um, if, if we're not competitive, um, we, we will not be successful. And, and so, so um, that, that's something that has to be uh, kept in mind um, when, um, when looking at uh, those various options that the farmer has, has to make a decision on. But we, we pay anywhere from uh, two to $3 for non-GMO uh, and uh, we pay over $20 for organic uh, per bushel. So um, the, 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 the incentives are definitely there, but uh, the bottom line is, is something that uh, some farmers will, will uh, sharpen their pencils and, and other farmers are, are uh, uh, still subject to the uh, G GMO um, advertising and, and pressures of, of, of seed companies where uh, there's only a fixed number of acres out there. And, and um, for every, every uh, bag of seed that is sold, it's taken away from another uh, seed company. So it can be pretty competitive. I would, uh, I don't disagree with that idea. Certainly from my perspective, obviously the economics have to be there. Otherwise it doesn't support itself. But I still come back to the fact that the economics have to reflect a set of values and that that ultimately is what's going to keep uh, the process moving forward. So, for example, um, grass fed beef, as, as I mentioned, um, I mean, the dirty secret is that, that you don't have a lot of input uh, in the sense like from a traditional. So I'm not buying corn. I'm not trucking in a bunch of stuff. Um, when I was producing grass fed beef, the grass grows for free out here in Ohio. It's amazing. You know, and the, and the animals eat it, and they produce an amazing product. So, the from a from an economic perspective alone, um, grass-fed beef makes a ton of sense, but it's not being widely adopted, and I uh, or uh, at least not um, as widely as I would like, certainly. And so, for me, it's got to go back to that idea that there's, a, I mean, as you mentioned, that that kind of that misinformation and that advertising that's being put in place. There's a stigma associated with it from a and the next generation is the one that's gonna shake that and, and think innovatively and, and outside of the box that the, that the current generation has kind of put themselves in. Not to say that there aren't folks that are looking to transition away from that and, and recognize the value there, but, um, but uh, for me, both from a producer perspective and from a consumer's perspective, our money is applied to where our values are. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean that you can just soldier on uh, on your values and not get paid for it and make a living. Absolutely not. Uh, the, so the economics have to be there. But I I put value uh, and, and a value structure uh, elevate that far above the economic side of things. If you don't have your values and you're not pursuing those values, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to be successful, um, whether or not there's a ton of money in the uh, in that or not. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I didn't mean to imply that the economics wasn't necessary. It's just the economics is a means that to, to farm or live the way that you want to farm. The economic dimension of it has to work. But, but the problem is if economics becomes the primary driving force behind what you do, you end up right back from where we are now. If you want to look at a, at a food system and a farming system that's driven by the economic bottom line, then look at the one we have now. And if you like that, uh, then keep doing it. But if you don't, economics has to work, but we have to look and say, look, there's a need for fundamental change, ecological, social, economic for more people and more opportunities. And, and it all has to work together. Sure, everyone. Um, so another question for all the panelists, um, Krista asked this, what, and I think this kind of um, is a good um, question to follow the previous one. What do you want to see our food system in Ohio to look like in 2031? How could USDA, state ag organizations, and local governments support your vision? Um, we could go in reverse order here. I don't know, Dave, if you want to get started on that. Uh, you know, what's really interesting about that is that that question reminds me of the labeling. Uh, and, I, and I'd like to use that as an example. Uh, the labeling laws of, of GMO. Uh, and the battles that we encountered a few years ago in the state of Vermont. Um, if, if, if by de consumer demand, they uh, really wanted to have uh, the food uh, mandatory, if it, it contained GMO uh, origin grains in it, that was labeled and it had to state that. And, and uh, it, was, it was fiercely fought. So, so that, that's, a, that's an example of how uh, the state of Ohio and, and even, even beyond, uh, that can really help the uh, consumers see what they're eating is, is a big part or a big factor in all of this. And, and uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a battle and, and the consumers uh, should demand it. And, and it has to come from the consumer. Uh, pushing it up, upstream from, from the supply level is very difficult. Uh, it has to come uh, the other direction if, 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 if we really want to, to see change. Um, Paul, do you want to go ahead and take- I was trying to remember the order, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, what, I think that's an amazing question. I love to think about it and, and do a little bit of dreaming. Um, so my answer is um, I would see Mobile Slaughter in Ohio uh, also serves as a shameless pitch for the project. Um, and then I would, uh, I can envision and would want to see somewhat of a decentralized. Uh, I think uh, this idea that John uh, presented is really compelling to me about a, you know, that, that independent farmer, but he spoke and I, and I couldn't agree more uh, about this idea of, of the need for collaboration to really be successful and, and cooperative models. So um, yeah, the, the vertical ultra condensed um, uh, processing and, and overall business structure around food, I would love to see that decentralized a little bit uh, and more to a, a regional and or local level. Um, I can't as a ex livestock guy, let the opportunity go uh, to say something about regulation um, and I, so in the future, I would love to see the reins pulled back on, on some of the regulations that are so squarely in the way of innovation for no apparent reason. Uh, I would never, uh, you know, suggest that we, um, that we abandon food safety as a primary concern or anything like that. But I mean, let's be honest, there are so many regulations out there that I had to comply with and that producers all across the state have to comply with that have absolutely nothing to do with food safety. They're simply bureaucratic red tape. Uh, and I'm sure they did at some point, but they no longer do. Um, and so I would love to have somebody go back through with a gigantic sword and cut through a lot of that red tape um, and get it back to what it should be all along, which is food safety. Um, and then finally, uh, as we've already discussed, uh, my, my dream world is one and where a consumer is intentional about their food again. Whether that means that they choose something that I produced or they go to the fast food restaurant, I could argue that, but for me, 
as long as they're making a conscious decision instead of a default habit-based uh, and, and misinformed choice, that would be an amazing future for me. Because I think in that future where consumers are have their eyes open to food options, um, this type of ecological pasture-based livestock and other uh, you know, non-GMO producing, uh, that just rises to the, to the top automatically if consumers are, uh, take that first step in doing the research for themselves. Thank you. And, and Vic, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, a lot of uh, things that I would like to see in 10 years is just going along with what was just mentioned about education. Um, I think people don't know what they don't know. So from my perspective, the more people learn about what's in the, what they're consuming, what, what from the, you know, for every aspect of of the life of the plant or the animal and what it consumed or you know what what helped it grow or whatever i think that the more we can educate people the the better decision making they can make um, from a government perspective uh, you know the state of new york a few years ago offered incentives for craft beer producers uh, that if they met a certain target amount of raw materials that they procured from within the state, they, they actually got benefits, tax benefits and credits. And I would love to see Ohio do something like that that really promotes local. And it can really create a lot of energy in a supply chain. And it's, it's pretty modest from a dollar perspective, but highly impactful if you're a small independent brewer uh, and you're competing with, with very big industrialized competitors. Um, so those are a couple of things that I, I'd love to see. Let me just uh, comment briefly. I'll, I'll stick with kind of the policy end of it, the change in government policies. Uh, the kind of agriculture we have today is largely a reflection of changes in government policies in the late 60s and early 70s. That's basically when federal policy shifted from supporting, you know, independent family farms as a means of food security to supporting productivity, and we chose kind of the industrial model of agriculture. So in, in one way or another, all of the major uh, federal farm policies basically support this very fragile, vulnerable, risky, but very efficient industrial production system of agriculture, where you're talking about price supports or subsidized crop insurance. Taxpayer pays about 60% of the cost of crop insurance that's yours, not only the yield of the price. So you can go out and plant the whole county on a single crop, and the taxpayer will help you insure that crop so that you don't lose anything on it. Um, and the price supports and then subsidized credit and uh, uh, pre preferential tax uh, treatment for large investments, the whole range of things supports large scale, specialized, standardized, consolidated agriculture. And if we change the policies, I would argue that that the alternative to industrial agriculture is really further developed now than the industrial agriculture system was in the 1970s. And if we had a change in, in farm policies, we could see a change in agriculture very dramatic in a relatively short period of time and moved away from basically absorbing the risk of this large scale, specialized, efficient, but risky agriculture and started absorbing the risk of those people that wanna transition from industrial agriculture to these more sustainable agriculture models. Well, you're talking about regenerative agriculture, resourceful, ecological, holistic, uh, grass-based, pasture-based, that, that fit the ecological and social objectives and, and just in, ensure the incomes of the families that want to transition from or want to get started in that kind of farming operation rather than ensuring the, the production of, of mass marketed, mass distributed commodities. Then you'd have opportunities for farmers to make the transition without having to absorb all of the risk as they do today. So I, I argue that we could, we could have basically any kind of agriculture you want in Ohio and the United States right now, if we develop the right kind of farm policies to make it feasible for farmers to create it. Great, thank you all so much for answering that. Um, we, we're at 1216, um, I just would, if you all have a few more minutes, I want to ask one more question because I think that this is important. Um, somebody asked about issues surrounding farm labor. Um, 
the dependence we have on immigrants in this sector, how does this tie to the valuation of our food system? And regarding the ind um, industrialization of agriculture and food supply chains, do you feel that the hunger relief system, operations like food banks and pantries is also a trend we've outgrown or is it a useful means to alleviate poverty? And how does this relate to economic justice? So that's a lot of questions there, um, but I am, uh, I think that, um, I am just curious on how we, uh, I mean, you mentioned the food utility earlier, John, which is yeah. really intriguing. Um, but I, th I think that's so many people are, are hungry now more than, you know, they were a year ago, I think. Yeah. Well, let me just, just follow up on that and I'll be brief about it. But this idea of a community food utility basically lets you determine what kind of food system you want within the community. I would make it voluntary. People can choose to join it or not join it to become a part of it. But, but if you created something like this where you separate your own community basically from the marketplace, not isolate it, but kind of protect it from the economic pressures of the global economy, then you could say, okay, within our, within our local community, we're going to procure food from people who pay their farm workers a decent wage and have good working conditions for them and this sort of thing. And you make the decision, sure, it's going to cost us something more, but, but we want to make sure that our food is produced by people who, who are making a decent living and have a decent quality of life. And we could say within the community, we want to make sure that everyone has good nutritious food, not just the cheapest food that we can buy. Like we're feeding our kids in school, the cheapest food you can buy anywhere in the world. Uh, we can say our kids are going to get good, nutritious food. So we're going to get it from local farmers who agree to produce it in such a way that you have healthy soils and healthy crops and healthy livestock. You can set your own standards within the community. I don't know any other way of changing the whole of it except change it a community at a time so that you can reflect the values of the people within that community as how workers are treated. Uh, that everyone gets enough food, everyone gets enough to eat, the farmers can make a decent living, and, and we pay the cost. You talk about the, the small amount of money we're spending on feed. We as consumers can afford the cost of food that would be involved in producing food that's ecologically sound, socially responsible, and make it economically viable for everyone involved if we just took on collectively and said this is what we're going to do. And I think if we did that in one community, the results would be so favorable and so good that other communities would adopt it. And we would develop regional and global network of community-based food systems that were socially responsible, ecologically sound, and economically viable. Maybe idealistic, but what's wrong with that? Do any of the other panelists want to kind of just say some last words on that? those questions? Uh, I'd like to uh, first just emphasize yes, yes, yes to what you just heard um, uh, as far as getting away from cheap in general. And, and a shout out to John who in the chat bar um, uh, put it very well uh, that that uh, bullshit always is cheaper than truth uh, in, in lots of different ways, but also in food. Um, that being said, uh, another thing that I think could, could really help address this issue is to get uh, a certain group of folks into a room together and I actually had an opportunity to do this. I was part of a, a steering committee for the Ohio Smart Agriculture Product uh, Project uh, a couple of years ago. And we, around a, a table, we had hunger advocates um, and we had producers and we had retailers and we had uh, uh, government organizations and extension and uh, you know all, all of these folks. And I learned how really all of us even if we uh, wanted to avoid this kind of a concept, we were all very siloed. So the hunger uh, advocates and the folks that were really, really concerned with this sort of, was the idea of, of uh, uh, food banks and that kind of thing, they, they wanted to, their whole purpose was to get food to people. They didn't really care what kind of food, you know? And so we had this kind of conversation and, and so they were very siloed and very focused on their one specific issue. And just as much as I was and trying to advocate for, for what I was doing at the time. And so through that conversation and that mutual understanding, I think we both got to a better place. Uh, and so, uh, so I guess overall, I would just kind of advocate for this idea of getting outside of our wheelhouse, getting outside of our silo and talking with and communicating with folks with, with these other types of priorities 
and coming communally together to a better solution than we are proposing individually with our hyper-focused uh, kind of a concept. Because there's lots of things covered in that question, which I love, but um, the way we get there is we get folks talking and, and thinking outside of the box um, to, to come up with real meaningful solutions. All right, thanks. And um, Vic and Dave, do either of you want to add anything? Uh, I, I guess I can touch base on it a little bit. Um, keep in mind that when you're a niche player in this and, and you have a product that you're growing, that the closer you get to the consumer, the easier it is to, to make things happen. Uh, in, in our example, where we're selling to the farmer the seed and we're reselling the grain and selling to another business, who is, is uh, very, uh, very much conscious about what their costs are, uh, it, 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 it's tough and, and everything has to make sense. Uh, the farmer is not gonna grow it without an economic incentive and the buyer is not going to buy it. In other words, the processor of these grains that we uh, deal in, they're not going to buy it unless we're the cheapest. And uh, quality is, is demanded and, and, and uh, a cheaper price is expected. So um, it, it kind of depends on where you fit in, 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 the, uh, in the chain uh, and what your, what your product actually is. All right, well, thanks. So Vic, anything else? I, I just agree with what everyone said. And I, I think education and having a voice is key and, and having the right people make that voice amplify to consumers to make decisions. Uh, you know, I think voices are controlled by very large organizations. So it's very hard to, to uh, when you're in the niches, it's very hard to get your voice amplified. All right, thank you all so much. I don't wanna cut into our lunch break too much. So um, we will be right back here at 1245 and Leslie Schaller, who's the Director of Programs with the Appalachian Center for Economic Networks and Business, Business Director and Worker Owner at Casa Nueva Restaurant in Athens, Ohio, will be giving it giving us um, giving a talk. So please stay with us um, and we'll be back at 1245. Um, and just thank you so much to all of the panelists. This was really great discussion and um, really informative. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you very much.